very helpful for, for your successor. John is going to talk to us on the subject of seeing Scotland afresh, how we look to a changing world, and then there will be a session for questions and answers afterwards. So, John, if I may pass over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, David. I share the pleasure, uh, uh, the opportunity to um, uh, commemorate uh, Michael Shea in this lecture for several reasons. I think the encouragement of debate about contemporary issues is, as, is an inspiring way to honour anyone's memory. But it's particularly apt for someone as committed to such debate uh, as Michael, who, through his generosity, which Mona continues, uh, provided a home for such debate through the Ramsey Gardens uh, seminars. And second, because I admire both Michael's career of outstanding public service and his energetic contribution to Scottish public life, including his support for a better home for the photographic works, which give Scotland international significance in the history of photography. And third, because I hope that Michael would see importance in my choice of subject, given his perspective on the world from his own career in the Foreign Service and the Royal Household, and his experience of living through uh, the first decade of devolution and the process of debate which preceded it in the 1990s. It's difficult to address any aspect of uh, Scotland's position without giving rise to the assumption that one is commenting, whether directly or obliquely, on the prospects and merits of further constitutional change. There are observations to be made about how newspapers in other countries have reported our recent remarkable election outcome, and I expect most of us have heard some speculation about how constitutional uncertainty might affect the decisions of internationally mobile businesses. But my focus is on how we've been perceived up until now, taking the past two decades as my time frame, and on the view from those who make it their business to be well informed about Scotland because they're involved in government, rather than from those whose view of Scotland may be narrower or less well informed. I do have some consolation to offer anyone who was hoping for a dose of constitutional speculation. My central proposition about how we're seen elsewhere is that our handling of constitutional change so far is regarded as a great strength. It will be obvious, therefore, that my remarks will lend themselves readily to any speculation in which you may wish to indulge about whether that view of us will be changed as a result of whatever you believe will flow from recent electoral outcomes. Perceptions matter. It's a rare individual who has no regard for what others think of them. It's natural, therefore, that we should care collectively about what others think of us as a nation. It's natural that we should wish those in other countries to think well of us as the people of Scotland and of Scotland itself. This is more than a collective vanity. There are good reasons, both practical and moral, for caring about how others see us. The practical reasons are well encapsulated in the explanation for the inclusion in the Scottish Government's Scotland Performs website of a national indicator about how Scotland looks to others. Scotland performs, for the benefit of members of the majority of the population who have never heard of it, uh, is part of what I've recently learned from contacts in Australia to call the Scottish model of government. It's an attempt by the Scottish government to define a shared aspiration for the Scotland in which we wish to live and to give people the information required to judge whether we're succeeding in moving towards that aspiration. At its heart are 45 national indicators, which provide a basis for judging our progress towards the overall purpose which the Scottish Government has articulated for Scotland. One of those indicators is 
improve people's perceptions, attitudes and awareness of Scotland's reputation. I was going to say that I can't be blamed for the slight ungrammatical <laughs> element uh, in those words, but uh, since Scotland Performance was created on my watch, I'm afraid I can be blamed. <laughs> the website offers this explanation of its inclusion among the 45 national indicators. People's willingness to live, learn, visit, do business in and invest in Scotland has a significant impact on our economy. That's as hard-headed a rationale for regarding others' view of Scotland as an important topic uh, as one could look for. It may surprise you to know that the hard edge of the rationale is matched by a hard edge to data by which we can seek to measure those perceptions. The splendidly named Anholf GFK Roper Nation Brands Index <laughs> boils the elusive question of perceptions down to a single number on the basis of a broad-based methodology of sampling opinions in 20 countries around the world. With shades of Douglas Adams, I am able to tell you that the answer to the question, <laughs> how does Scotland look to the rest of the world, is 59.67. <laughs> I can also tell you that this is about the same, sometimes a small amount better, than the view held across the world about New Zealand, Denmark, Finland or Ireland. I can tell you that between 2008 and 2010, the movement in the number was so small as to be within the margin of sampling error. I could go into more detail. Instead, I want to make one point. That the ebb and flow of day-to-day -day events in Scotland has little demonstrable effect on external perceptions and that only the very big shifts register. Having said that, I want to move away from this broad brush approach, useful though it is for its intended purpose, and offer you a more personal perspective of how Scotland looks to others in the more specialised world of those engaged in the business of government <coughs> elsewhere in the world. The interest in Scotland, which I encounter in governments elsewhere in the world, is outward looking towards the great common challenges of modern society and our changing world. In particular, the interest revolves around the importance of enabling groups of people to coexist within stable political structures which support the growth of prosperity and well-being and peaceful economic and social cooperation between countries. This perspective grows stronger as the evidence of our global interdependence becomes more widely apparent, as it has done through the impacts of the current financial crisis. <coughs> Who would have guessed that we were all so worried about how Greece could manage its national debt? <laughs> if one needed reminding of the seriousness of the consequences of dislocation between a government and the needs of groups within the society which that government serves, of failure to embrace and manage constitutional change to prevent and remedy such dislocation, the events of the past several weeks have provided many examples, uh, and that is not in any sense uh, a reference to our own election outcome. The immediacy of the events of the Arab Spring, the reminder through the detention of Radko Miladic of the consequences more than a decade ago of the dissolution of Yugoslavia and the difficulty of achieving successor states which could provide for the successful coexistence of distinctive ethnic identities. We've also had a powerful reminder that there's no automatic immunity from this within the British Isles through the Queen's visit to Dublin in May, which has prompted recall of the violence which accompanied the creation of the Irish Republic almost a century ago, as well as reminding us that the maintenance of a peaceful political solution to the government of Northern Ireland remains a demanding current challenge. This goes to the heart of international perceptions of Scotland. To understand those perceptions, we need to remind ourselves 
that someone in another country looking at international experience of constitutional change will see a general cor correlation with serious social unrest. This is true both from a historical perspective and a contemporary perspective. What people in other countries see when they look at Scotland is, by contrast, a country in which massive constitutional change has been accomplished without disruptive or violent social unrest, either before or after the change. They also see a country in which that constitutional change was accomplished without disruption to the effective performance by government of its functions. These aren't matters of peripheral or theoretical interest to those in other countries. One of the central concerns for many nation states at present is the challenge of containing the pressures created by heterodox identities within their populations, religious identities, cultural or ethnic identities, linguistic identities. Within Europe, we have the recent experience of the horrific conflicts and re subsequent redrawing of the political map of the Balkans, the continuing tensions within Spain about the relationships with Catalonia and the Basque region, and the stalemate of more than a year uh, in forming uh, a national government in Belgium, which can embrace the representatives of both the main linguistic communities. Elsewhere, the Chinese government, with its characteristic strategic thoughtfulness, makes evident that it is aware that a failure to maintain the integrity of its very diverse population could destabilise the remarkable economic growth which it is achieving. It has already had to consider how best to deal with the issues raised by tensions flowing from the distinctive ethnic identity of the Uyghur population in the north of China. Within India, too, with its own combination of a large country encompassing considerable religious and social diversity and an impressive record of economic growth, which could be stalled by political instability, the maintenance of stability has been strained at times in recent years by tensions between communities with differing religious identities. It's because of these realities that when other countries look at the experience of the UK over the past two decades, they are not struck primarily by the matters which often dominate our daily political discourse, by our frequent variations in the superstructures we place around the work of the health, education and justice systems, or by the fine-tuning of macroeconomic policy. The ones with which I have had discussions regard it as much more interesting that the relationship between the United Kingdom and Northern Ireland, Scotland, England and Wales has been so fundamentally redefined. And within that wider UK framework of constitutional change, they often regard Scotland as the most interesting element. This is because the relationship between the magnitude of constitutional change and the degree of breakdown in the functioning of the prior constitutional arrangement is such an unusual one. Unusual in that elsewhere, the degree of constitutional change is usually proportionate to the degree of prior civil disruption. And where there is disproportion, it's more commonly that constitutional change is more modest than one might have expected from the scale of civil unrest. In Northern Ireland, the degree of breakdown in the functioning of civil society was so severe for it to be obvious to those in other countries that any democratic government would be likely to seek to bring about a new constitutional settlement. In Wales, the new constitutional settlement did not initially amount to very much by comparison with Scotland or Northern Ireland. And the main point of deficit, the absence of primary legislative powers, has only just been remedied. It is Scotland which presents a very unusual set of circumstances. We have undergone substantial constitutional change with almost nothing by way of civil unrest or disruption of government which would register on the equivalent of a Richter scale of such things. It's of equal interest to other governments that an easy birth has been followed by an orderly infancy. We've had three governments 
which have each run their full terms and have been able to deliver most, if not all, of the measures to which they committed themselves in the immediate aftermath of their formation. Even if our electoral arrangements were designed to make it easy for governments to be stable and impose their will on the Parliament, this early settling down would not strike those from other political systems as being something to take for granted. But our electoral arrangements are not so designed. One must add to the mix an electoral system, widely believed until last month, to be an almost insurmountable obstacle to single party majority and which therefore required a political culture unaccustomed to either coalition or minority governments to come to terms with one or other of those unfamiliar arrangements for the exercise of power. For those in countries which have traditions of strong single party government themselves, whether through alter alternation between two party democratic models or through the evolution of single party rule, as in China, our experience of adapting so easily to coalition governments over the first eight years of devolution seems an achievement in itself. This is less so in the many countries which have well-established traditions of coalition government themselves, although not all of them would say that their experience provides a basis for assuming that stability and ability to deliver the government's intended programme are automatic corollaries of coalition government. What all countries find more remarkable is that our system was able to adapt with apparently similar ease to the much less common model of minority government. This sense of surprise elsewhere is greatly reinforced by the fact that our teething experience of minority government was on the basis of a governing party with well under 40% of the seats in the legislature. It's very difficult to find either precedent or parallel in other countries for a government which runs its term and is able broadly to pursue its programme under such an extreme disadvantage of parliamentary power without resort to a formal agreement of some kind with another political party. It's the equivalent of an athlete competing in the pole vault or high jump who delays entering the competition until the bar has already been set at the level of the existing world record. <laughs> The people to whom I speak in other countries do not necessarily wish to emulate us in the sense that they may have no desire to experiment with alternatives to strong single party government themselves. But they know that these things happen even in countries accustomed to single party government. Canada has been a striking example at various times over the past 80 years. And they're interested in what enables a system to continue to deliver stable and effective government when the electorate chooses to express a complex balance of views. It's no small thing, therefore, that Scotland has a reputation internationally for successful constitutional adjustment to accommodate a strong national identity. It's important to be clear, though, that the interest which this generates is not in our settlement as some form of template. There is some interest in the broad shape of the settlement, the fact that the Parliament has primary legislative powers, the balance of devolved and reserved functions, the degree of fiscal discretion, but the main interest is in the process of making the change and in our experience of settling into the change. For most of those elsewhere, all this translates into two main questions. First, what is it about the constitutional settlement? embedded in the Scotland Act 1998, which has made possible the three separate key achievements which I have described. Agreeing constitutional change without civil unrest, making the transition to new constitutional arrangements without disruption to the functioning of government, and adapting to unfamiliar and at times inherently challenging political outcomes without instability or loss of effective <coughs> government. The second question, what is it about the participants in Scotland's political system which has allowed the constitutional settlement to evolve so rapidly? While the nature of the questions asked is, my, in my experience, broadly the same between those in one country and another, I cannot tell you 
whether there is a similar commonality in whatever conclusions they are reaching about the answers. We do know, however, that their answers encompass some interesting perspectives. Professor Tom Devine has drawn attention recently to the view among some US commentators that Scotland has one of the most sophisticated electorates in the world. On that basis, one might conclude that the people of Scotland have set out to devise a rigorous testing process, both for their <laughs> constitutional settlement and for those responsible as ministers, as parliamentarians and as civil servants for making it work. I think I can say with confidence, however, that when I'm speaking to either politicians or civil servants in other countries, each of those groups is more likely to take the view that the virtues of their counterparts in Scotland must be the most probable cause <laughs> of the success. <laughs> For my part, I encourage the rather unfashionable view that the politicians elected to the Scottish Parliament in 1999 and subsequently have shown greater ability to respond to the challenges of unexplored political territory than it would have been reasonable to expect, bearing in mind the substantial proportion of them that had no experience of the exercise of political power. I do also draw out the evidence that the Scottish electorate has used a complex ele electoral system with considerable skill and with some signs of sophisticated collective intent. And, as you would expect, I do not seek to discourage those in other countries who believe that such success could not have been delivered without a substantial contribution from a highly flexible and very skillful <laughs> civil service. My reasons for bolstering such perceptions are relevant to the general views I wish to offer you about what we should do on the basis of the evidence available to us about how Scotland is perceived. My first proposition is simply that we need to make the effort to understand the perceptions. We cannot use perceptions to our advantage if we misunderstand them or if we misunderstand the realities of our own position ourselves. I also contend that it's sensible to explore the advantage to be obtained by building on positive perceptions of us which already exist before expending effort on trying to implant perceptions which we would like to exist but which those elsewhere do not currently hold. That may seem obvious, but in my experience, uh, much of the effort uh, di directed towards other countries falls into the second category uh, rather than the first. If the perception that Scotland offers a stable political environment because of our proven record of adapting successfully to challenges which destabilise or disorient some governments elsewhere, as I've argued, we should recognise that as a key strength in a world in which such challenges are becoming more widespread. We should recognise that potential partners of all kinds, international business, universities, governments, prefer to form partnerships with those who offer stability of relationships. My second proposition is that we should increase our degree of interest in those who show the greatest interest in us. Gaining benefit from perceptions of Scotland is easier to do in countries where the perceptions are rooted in reasons for interest in us which are likely to be sustained than in countries where we are forcing ourselves on people's attention or where there is interest in us for reasons which are likely to be transient, such as offering them wadges of money. I offer you the view that this implies that we should look increasingly eastwards. The very rapidly growing economies we see to the east have more reason to be and remain interested in the ways in which government systems adapt successfully, constitutionally, politically and strategically, than governments in which developed economies and relatively settled societies create a sense of imperviousness to such changes however misplaced that sense of imperviousness may be. We should regard it as good fortune that the interest of senior people within the Chinese government in our constitutional arrangements gives us a degree of access which I find astonishes people in the United States when I describe it to them. 
It is certainly the basis on which I've sought to ensure that I visit China regularly to demonstrate the value that we attach to dialogue with those in government. I know too that the International Futures Forum has been very active in building connections in Hong Kong, elsewhere in China and in India on the basis of their own reading of the direction of global developments. And Scottish ministers have greatly increased their engagement in the relationship with China. Creating a positive context within which, within which others can operate more easily is a key contribution for government to make. My third proposition is that Scottish businesses should seek to make greater use of the opportunities created by Scotland's positive international reputation in the government sphere. I cannot prove that the positive attitude to our fund management industry, which has been shown by the Chinese government in the recent past, would not exist without the close relationships which have been developed intergovernmentally for other reasons, but it seems to me foolish to disregard the potential indirect benefit of building such relationships. More recently, uh, there have been more mundane discussions uh, <laughs> about the role which government validation of the quality of agricultural seed materials can play in making Scotland and Scottish businesses a key partner in participating in the improvement of agricultural productivity in Scotland. But to see that as a small matter would be to overlook that agricultural productivity is a vital strategic issue for the Chinese government. Activities to which government is connected can also form part of the substance of economically beneficial exchanges, opening the door for other Scottish interests to build on the opportunities. Perhaps you already know that several years ago, the Chinese government concluded after a survey of educational qualification systems around the world that Scotland had devised the best framework for integrating recognition of vocational and academic achievement, and that they wished to use it in their economically vital drive to grow the technical skills of their population. The Scottish Qualifications Agency, as the custodian of our system, showed splendid entrepreneurial responsiveness by establishing a presence in China to work with the Chinese government on embedding our qualifications in China. I know that this connection has made the Chinese more receptive to collaboration with our universities, with the wide opportunities uh, which that <laughs> brings. But I do not know to what extent Scottish business succeeded in finding the opportunities which that connection must have offered. My fourth proposition is that we should recognise that there is mutual advantage with the rest of the UK in Scotland seizing our opportunities. It does not imply subversion of the United Kingdom to make more of Scotland's international reputation. It's true that back in 1997, when I was drafting text for the chapter of the devolution white paper which dealt with relations with the EU and negotiating that text uh, with those at the <coughs> centre of the Whitehall end of the process and very nearly doing serious damage to my career prospects in the process, there were those uh, for whom this was fraught territory and that there has been some occasional unreasonableness from some in the UK government in that territory subsequently. More importantly, however, is that the Foreign Office is the part of Whitehall which has understood devolution more quickly and better than the rest. This has proved immensely helpful in reinforcing the positive perceptions of Scotland which have flowed from the way devolution is regarded in other countries and in creating opportunities to take advantage of those perceptions. It has, for example, enabled the Scottish Government to embed posts within the Washington and Beijing embassies which progress a distinctive Scottish agenda while being fully integrated into the UK ambassador's team. It has also assisted a close working relationship between the Scottish Government's office in Brussels and the UK's permanent representation to the EU. Our ability to demonstrate these successful relationships in such important settings as Washington, Beijing and Brussels is taken by observers from those and other countries as a message both of the importance of Scotland within the UK 
and of Scotland's success in digesting the major constitutional change which devolution involved. And of course our staff there take opportunities and help others from Scotland to do so. I've reached my close without any reference to the obvious quotation from Burns about how others see us. <laughs> Although his view of the desirability of accurate self-knowledge fits my theme, his implication that we would be likely to be taken down a peg or two by that understanding does not. We underestimate the way our stock has risen elsewhere in the world through the events of the past two decades. My exhortation is that we should regard this as a great moment of opportunity to renew Scotland's strengths as an outward-looking country whose citizens have made such a mark on the world. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Ron. That, that, was a, that was a fascinating lecture. We've got about uh, 15 minutes, uh, maybe slightly over, for questions. There are microphones on each side. If you'd indicate that you want to speak, it's quite helpful, I think, um, for everybody. If First of all, you say who you are, and if you've got a, uh, an association, I mean, if you belong to, say, the university or something like that, um, that would help to give the background of what you're saying, that's, that's helpful too, but it's not compulsory. Uh, the one other thing that's helpful is to ask questions rather than give lectures because we have a very good lecturer. Who, who, who would like to start? Yeah, third row back. Um, if you come down this side. No, no, no. Here. Sorry. That's it. Thank you very much. I need to stand up or you can't see me. My name is Christian Richard. I'm an educationalist, a political activist and a writer. I belong to the Scottish Constitutional Convention when it started. I fought for devolution throughout my failed political career because I really believed it satisfied the Scots' desire for a greater say in our own affairs. I stood in 1999, and the reason I was denied a seat by my party at that time was, quote, Christine, because you fought for devolution, it would have looked as if you were right if we gave you a seat. Now, that's, that's right. by the by. That's just the background. What I want to say to you is I thoroughly enjoyed everything you had to say. I'm a member of Scotland's Futures, which is, you know, is looking at the domestic spending particularly. But do you see constitutional change, if it's not independence, which I believe it should not be, uh, becoming part of a federal Britain? Well, you're tempting me on to uh, territory that I took considerable care to uh, <laughs> uh, uh, avoid uh, going, uh, going on to. Um, there's no denying, is there, that many other countries find federal solutions a more convenient way uh, of, uh, of dealing uh, with, this, uh, with this set of issues. Um, but it's not trouble-free. I'm recently back from uh, a few weeks in Australia um, working with um, a couple of the state governments there um, who are very worried um, that their federal settlement is about to destabilise uh, by a growth of uh, centralisation and a diminution uh, of, the, uh, of the state's powers and who are interested in Scotland uh, precisely because with, le with apparently less formal protection uh, we appear to manage that dynamic uh, more, uh, more successfully. Um, so it's not obvious to me that we should persuade ourselves um, uh, that a federal solution is a better one uh, than the dynamic solution we have for Scotland. I absolutely understand how it might solve some headaches for other people uh, elsewhere and, and, and uh, it, how it might deal with the, um, the English problem as it's caused. Although, as we all know, the, the disproportionality of the constituent elements is a, is a challenge to a, a, a federal solution. Uh, I come down on the side of... Uh, thinking that a federal outcome is in the less probable column, not the more probable column. 
Thank you. Let's go here and then here. Uh, uh, just, just beside you, the gentleman there, and then down to this row. Yourself, sir, first, please. Yes, yes. Thank you. Um, instead of you explain who I am, I'm known all over the world by ex-students as Old Melly. <laughs> and that was because we were always working to keep together. Just like in the army, I was in charge of the Bolshe platoon, and they were all kind of folk who had to somehow find an answer on the ground. As an ex-engineer, planner, you name it, I'm concerned about how we get to a really effective collaboration. I've been into it all my life, I suppose, for one reason or another. But how do you get it in a world which is still arbitrarily into competition and getting things and winning and so forth, when really there's only one option for us to survive, and we have to relearn how to contrive to survive? Well, I strongly share the view that we need to remember that we're a nation with an export-led uh, economy uh, and that we inhabit a slightly inconvenient <coughs> geographical location in the world uh, on the uh, northwestern uh, edge of, uh, uh, of, of Europe. Uh, so I, I, it, it really it chimes with the essence uh, of my remarks that I think that uh, taking that more seriously than, than perhaps we have done um, is vital to our future. Um, I also uh, agree with you uh, that being sucked into the transience of we can give you a bigger grant than the, uh, than, than the next person um, is, a, uh, is an unproductive and I would say outdated way uh, of um, Constructing our relationship with uh, with uh, with with other countries, um, uh, and I don't just mean money. I think there are you know, there are variations on trading trading short term advantage of various kinds, which uh, I think uh, is misplaced. Uh, so my answer is that one has to build trust and affinity, uh, which leads others to. Um, uh, look past some of those <coughs> shorter term uh, considerations and themselves invest uh, in the long term uh, nature of the, uh, of, of the relationship. One builds trust in any relationship by uh, bringing in int integrity to the relationships that one, uh, that one has with others. We think of ourselves <coughs> as, a, as a country that has a tendency to bring integrity uh, to our, our dealings with, uh, with others, we perhaps you know, should refresh our memories on how important that is if we want the kind of uh, uh, collaboration that, uh, uh, that, that, uh, uh, that you uh, describe. But when I was preparing the lecture, I toyed with um, uh, whether I could include a, a, a slightly non-PC uh, recollection uh, from the period uh, back in the 90s uh, when I was much preoccupied with Scotland's relationship with the Nordic countries and that, that conversation reached the point where serious consideration was given to whether Scotland on its own could become a member of the Nordic Council. Um, eventual answer, no. Um, but uh, I, I remember um, uh, after two or three years of this cooperation, one of the Finns saying to me uh, that uh, joining the European Union had been something of an eye-opener for them uh, because they discovered that uh, it wasn't true uh, for representatives of every country uh, that uh, a commitment given, a word given, would be honoured. <laughs> uh, and amongst themselves, the Nordic countries were accustomed to a shared culture uh, in which a handshake was binding, to use a, an old-fashioned concept. And what they saw in Scotland was a partner uh, in which you could expect the same uh, sort of values. I think I steer clear of the non-PC bit by saying nothing about the countries in which they didn't uh, see, see those, uh, those characteristics. So trust is my answer. Thank you. Yes, and then at the back, about two-thirds down. 
Uh, thank you. My name is June Andrews. I'm from the University of Stirling. The first thing I'd like to say is that I am sure Michael Shea would have enjoyed this lecture and that um, in my work in dementia care, we had great reason to be grateful, I had, for the encouragement and support that he gave introducing us to people. He was a, he was a brilliant help and support. So my question really two small questions. I was fascinated and I can't remember the number whether it was 59 and three quarters and I thought I quite liked the people who we were like but I would love to know who was above and below us in that <laughs> number. And uh, my other question is um, actually in relation to my work which is mainly in health and social care which is a devolved issue and um, I wonder how the English see us in the light of the changes that have taken place in Scotland because they think that there are I, in my view, English people think that new things have happened since devolution, like a new health and social care system and legal system even. They were always there, but they f it sometimes feels as if they think we invented it all in the last 10 years, and I wonder whether that's your perception as well. Okay. Well, I thought someone might be interested <laughs> in an elaboration of, of uh, 59.67. Uh, so I actually have some data uh, with me. Um, uh, we, um, the, uh, the identities of countries outside the top ten in the index are treated as, uh, as confidential. So I can tell you that we're number 14, um, and I can tell you uh, that that places us pretty much at the head of the pack uh, of uh, countries who are not uh, th those with obvious and powerful positive global uh, reputations because of their size. Uh, so we managed to knock spots off everybody else who's, uh, who's as small as us and a bit bigger than us. It's just that uh, when, when other countries start piling up the tens of millions, we, uh, we fall behind um, uh, a bit. Um, and uh, that, uh, that and, we, and, and our position has been creeping up gradually in the, uh, in the rankings. Although our score hasn't changed, our relative position to others has, uh, uh, has improved. Uh, I, so the, um, I, could tell, I, I could, I think, tell you who the top ten are, so yeah. you, you know who's definitely the first three, um, yeah. uh, 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 ahead of us. Uh, I'm not sure I have that data, actually. Um, Australia, the United Kingdom, Canada, Sweden, uh, the United States. Um, the top three from memory are the United States, uh, Sweden, and the UK. Um, on what they think of us in England, I have a piece of stunning good news for you. <laughs> um, because I do, I do have data on where uh, people in each of the 20 countries in the world who form part of this sample place us relative to um, others. And nobody likes us as much as uh, uh, the other inhabitants of the UK. <laughs> <laughs> they place us fifth in the world. Um, the next nearest are the Australians, the Canadians and the Swedes who put us at number 11. And we've done something serious to offend the Egyptians <laughs> <laughs> who place us at number 32. Um, so I, I think I, I think there is some evidence of, uh, of, strong, of strong positive perceptions. Because remember, this is recent data. The, you know, this is people asked for their perceptions in the last few, few years. But of course, we're talking about people here. It's a, it's a thousand people in each of 20 countries who are interviewed to uh, aggregate this, uh, this data. Um, we're not talking um, about... Um, uh, the inhabitants of the UK government and, uh, and, and where they, uh, uh, and, and where they uh, place us. Uh, but I, I think, that's, uh, I think that's, that's, that's getting better. I mean, for years we did brilliantly being very different without anybody noticing. Uh, and that, that was probably a key to our success for uh, much of the time. So no, I, I don't think there is awareness uh, that, that, uh, that our capacity to innovate uh, and to be positively different didn't start with uh, devolution. But uh, I see no reason to trouble them with that. <laughs>
Thank you. There was somebody yes, there, and then right, right at the back on the left, and then if we could come down to this, yeah, and pick you out uh, after that. Uh, thank you. Crawford Gillis, uh, Scottish Enterprise. Uh, so John, that was absolutely fascinating. Can I take you back to your final uh, sentence when you talked about Scotland's strengths as an outward-looking country, I think something that was implicit in, uh, in your lecture. Can you say just a bit more about that? And in particular, do you think we are sufficiently outward-looking? Well, I think parts of our business space have a terrific track record uh, of being outward-looking. I think parts of our uh, university base um, are holding their own uh, with uh, universities from anywhere in the world in the vigour uh, with which they, uh, they explore uh, university uh, cooperation and the spin-off benefits that that can, uh, uh, that that can, uh, that that can generate. Socially, no, I don't think we feel like, a, uh, like an outward uh, facing country um, and part of the reason for my choice of theme this, e this evening was that I feel we've become a bit too preoccupied with looking inwards at our internal uh, debate uh, and forgotten uh, that, uh, that paying attention uh, to external uh, perceptions is likely to prove hugely uh, important uh, uh, for us so I think uh, I I think, there's a, I think there's a balance. I, by and large, I would say that those um, whose outward focus is most important to Scotland's success are, by and large, uh, creditably outward focused. Um, I think that that is less representative uh, of attitudes across Scotland than it would be helpful for it to be. The gentleman right at the back, and then halfway down on this side, and there's somebody in the middle at the back, yes. Hello, I'm uh, Bob Black. I'm the Auditor General for Scotland. John, could I start off by saying that we too have been subject of uh, recurrent interest from uh, ch various parts of China, starting with a visit by the Auditor General for China a few years ago to my little office in George Street, and followed subsequently by several other visits over the last two or three years. And I'm sure it's not unrelated to your point about um, the interest in how we govern ourselves and our systems of governance. <clears throat> um, more to the point, uh, I thought uh, your talk was fascinating and it echoes very much the theme in uh, the historian Francis Fukuyama's recent book um, called The Origins of Political Order, which I've been reading on trains and planes. And his, his thesis is that um, absolute systems of government collapse for three reasons. Firstly, they don't have an, affecting, a, a, an effective functioning state. Secondly, they don't have a strong respect for a legal system that is founded in libertarian values. And thirdly, there's not a culture in which state organs are held accountable in any way to the people. So turning to your question about how did we manage this so skillfully in Scotland, I think it's actually at least in part because those three elements were well embedded um, in Scottish society. But I also think there are two other things. This is coming to the question uh, in, in a moment. Sorry to be so long. Firstly, I think it was enormously beneficial for devolution that the Scottish Parliament was born into such a benign public spending environment. And related to that, that the threat of social disruption was mitigated significantly by the strength of the welfare state, which over the last 10 years has grown. And we've now got, what, something over 11 billion pounds of transfer payments from the Exchequer into Scotland in welfare pay payments. So the question ultimately is this. Whilst um, the conditions of respect for a functioning state law and accountability of that great trinity might be here, with the economic challenges that are ahead of us, to what extent is there a risk that this settlement might be destabilized? You're trying to get me into trouble. <laughs> um, let, let, me, uh, let, let me first touch on a couple of things, uh, Bob. I, just one thing about China. There's a, there's a conundrum which I have never been able to solve, which is that the Chinese have been interested in Scotland at a senior level 
for a long time in a way that no other country in the world has been. We, we, we've, we've had a succession of senior visitors to Scotland uh, which is quite unlike uh, the voluntary effort that we've received from other countries over quite a long time. And I cannot for the life of me understand uh, why, that is, uh, why that is so. Uh, I, I feel that latterly we've begun to provide a bit more of an underpinning justification for that relationship. But there is something very interesting about uh, a Chinese view that there are things of value to be found here, which I think may well connect to your points um, about the, you know, the trinity of powerful sustaining forces uh, in, um, uh, in society. Um, the second point I wanted to make is that um, one of the things that deeply puzzles people elsewhere is why is, is the fact that we made constitutional change at the point in time when things were getting economically better because, as I tried to bring out, the general rule is the reverse of that. You know, economic adversity is uh, an exacerbating force in tensions within a, uh, within a society. And, and if, civil, if civil disruption is going to break out, it's much more likely to uh, break out uh, in challenging uh, economic times. So I abs absolutely agree with you uh, that devolution was lucky uh, to be um, you know, to be born into an unprecedented period of public expenditure growth, um, but there's still a puzzle contained within that, um, and that puzzle makes me sceptical uh, that as we as we go through a more challenging uh, economic period, we will see significant changes in thinking uh, about our. Uh, thinking about our constitutional arrangements. I think um, people are sufficiently grown up to know that good times and bad times come uh, and that uh, sound constitutional arrangements have to be able to cope with uh, uh, both of them and that you can't shift horses uh, when economic circumstances uh, change. Uh, so I shall, be, I shall be surprised if we, if we see... Uh, any significant diminution in support for the constitutional arrangements that we have. Might we see caution uh, about further constitutional change? Yes, of course we might. Uh, people are more cautious about a whole range of things uh, in, uh, in difficult economic circumstances, and it's not an implausible proposition uh, that, uh, that they will be more cautious about constitutional issues. Um, as we go through the worst of the uh, uh, of, of the uh, of, of the economic uh, challenge, uh, but uh, since I spectacularly failed to predict the outcome of the election, uh, I'm not much in the prediction game at the moment. It was here halfway down, and then the gentleman has got his hand up in, in the towards the second row from the back, and then there's one more third row from the back, and I think we're going to have to draw a line there. Yes, yes it was here. My, my name's Jim Craig, and you can plead the Fifth Amendment, if you like, but uh, the devolution settlement did inherit the structures of the old Scottish office, and uh, you're familiar with Whitehall and obviously with the European Union uh, set up. But do you think, looking at the overall political scene, that we've become more adept at dealing with process than we have in producing product. In other words, delivering something that matters to people up and down the country, that we're adept at the processing of it, and that we may fall down on the actual results that people expect. Yes, I have... I have potentially a long and complicated answer uh, to, uh, uh, to, uh, to that, um, and it, it was territory that I deliberately kept out of this evening's lecture because there isn't any way that I can properly cover it alongside the, uh, the, other, the other topics. But if I can run through the, the bones of, uh, of, uh, 
of what I uh, of, of what I think. Yes, uh, we had an advantage in inheriting um, uh, unestablished uh, bureaucracy as the foundation uh, of this. Uh, but I don't think. I don't think we should take it for granted that bureaucracies travel across boundaries of constitutional change without loss of effectiveness or um, periods of, of, of dysfunctionality. I don't think experience elsewhere would, uh, would, would, would bear that out. And, um, yeah, one, of, one of the long bits of my argument would be to uh, consider uh, the relationship of the bureaucracy to the political system in the UK and how it differs from other countries and whether that might be part of the uh, that might be part of the explanation uh, for our success in moving the, uh, the accumulated benefits of, uh, uh, of bureaucratic experience across the boundaries of constitutional change. But more importantly, um, I think that um, we, we've begun to do something particularly valuable um, about um, exposing um, to public discussion, uh, the failure uh, to deliver substance in 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 some uh, in in some areas. My my view is that we were that we were particularly good at extracting um, value out of familiar ways of doing things in relation to that slice of the social or economic challenge to which which responded. To those, uh, to those things. In you know, insofar as known government technology would work, I think we'd reached a point where we were particularly good at making it work. I think that's enabled us to get faster to the understanding that there are aspects of our economic and social challenges for which uh, conventional wisdom will not deliver us um, the kind of improved outcomes. Uh, that we would uh, that, that we would like to see, uh, and I think that Scotland um, is engaging in that difficult discussion um, with more readiness and openness than I think is the is the case elsewhere. And I think that the fact that we're in a period of constitutional change and contemplating what it is we want, what we want government to be, and what we want from it that makes it uh, easier or is more conducive to, uh, to, to having uh, that discussion. So my answer is, yes, I do think uh, that we've probably fallen short of expectations, allowing for the fact that I think that expectations of devolution <coughs> and what it would deliver were very high. But I think that uh, through our understanding of that, we, we show some prospect of being able to break through through that to uh, new approaches from government uh, that uh, unlock the gains uh, that people in my view rightly uh, want to uh, see and uh, I'm an optimist about the Christie Commission here. Yeah. Thank you. The gentleman uh, uh, two from, two from yeah. the back and then there was Lady Justice. Uh, Richard Simpson, I was one of the novice MSPs in 1999 and thank you for your kind remarks in that respect uh, and your fascinating talk. I want to uh, choose a slightly different uh, subject and that is that we seem to have chosen to have had a particular relationship with Malawi and I just wonder if you have any views on that type of relationship as opposed to the ones you tended to focus on of developing with China and, and Asia and whether that is a, something that aids our perception or changes our perce the, the perception of us uh, in any way that might be valuable to us. Yeah. Yes. Um, I think that's, that's very interesting. Um, and I may not steer clear of keeping myself out of trouble here. Um, I have a strong personal view uh, that Scotland was encouraged for too many years to think of itself as a country that held out its hand to get things rather than stretched out its hand to give things. Uh, and I see the relationship with Malawi as a conscious attempt uh, to engage in a giving uh, relationship, um, which I think largely floats free of any particular rationale. I mean, yes, you can point to 
some historical connections between Scotland and Malawi. But I think, yeah, I think the simple truth is that um, uh, ministers were looking for something, some opportunity to demonstrate that spirit of giving, uh, and Malawi uh, was sitting in a convenient space to, uh, to be the recipient of that. But I think the other interesting thing about it um, is that we set out uh, consciously to give of ourselves, as it were, rather than to give money. It was a different philosophy of relationship with, um, uh, with other countries. Uh, it was about being generous with our experience, generous with our knowledge, uh, and helping to, uh, helping to grow capacity rather than the alternative model of international aid which can so easily be represented as self-interested and, and as a way of tying a fledgling economy into uh, a set of economic uh, transactions. Uh, so I, I think it's hugely important that Scotland came so early when it might have been preoccupied with, with other things uh, to a desire to find a way to demonstrate that outward-looking giving relationship uh, with, the, uh, with, with the, the rest of the world. And it is and remains a small thing, but I, I would argue that its, it's emblematic importance is far greater than its <coughs> practical significance. Interesting. And then the, the lady, uh, just one round Thank further forward, and that has to be the last question. I'm Thank afraid. you very much. My name is Julia Amor, and I've just taken over as the director of the British Council in Scotland. And as you know, um, one of the uh, areas we work in is supporting the major educational and cultural institutions of Scotland to internationalise. And I was interested to know what conditions you thought need to be in place in the next few years to enable those um, important calling cards of Scotland around the world to continue to, to take advantage of the opportunities for partnership which grow all the time but these windows are quite, uh, are quite small and, and grow and disappear as other nations take advantage of them. Okay, I probably won't do justice to this but, but two things immediately uh, occur to me. Um, the first is I think there is a pressing need for stronger cooperation between our universities in the, in the effort to, um, uh, to engage with, uh, with, with other countries. Um, we, we have some fantastic universities, but in trying to win the prize of the best collaborations in the world, um, we have to recognise that we are competing uh, with some institutions elsewhere uh, that can easily outpunch us uh, through the scale of their activities, the scale of the resources that they can, that they can bring to that. Um, it seems to me that Scotland's universities collectively are a much more powerful selling point to the rest of the world uh, than, uh, than they are individually, even our, our most outstanding uh, uh, universities. And, you know, we, we do brilliantly well in the world economic rankings. It's great that Scotland has uh, a top 30 in the world university when the whole of Germany uh, has a similar uh, ranking. Um, so you know, there's nothing to apologise for in the quality of our individual institutions. But if we're, if we're seriously asking ourselves the question, how do we up the leverage, cooperation must be the answer. Um, my second point may seem a bit tangential, um, but it's a source of considerable frustration uh, to me uh, that um, uh, the amateurs uh, such as me uh, find themselves elaborating the kind of thesis that I've uh, put before you this evening, and that our universities, sitting in the heart of what I think is one of the most fascinating periods of public policy in any country in the world are not themselves doing much uh, to articulate uh, that uh, to an outside world which I find curious and interested to, uh, to hear uh, more um, about that. Um, and I, one of my beliefs is that it's incumbent on anyone in Scotland 
um, to tell the mo to give the most positive account of Scotland that they can when they uh, when they deal with people uh, from uh, from other uh, other countries. Um, and I feel that the universities would both confer a general benefit, but would also um, make themselves. Uh, a centre of uh, a centre of interest, if slightly more of their energy uh, went into telling the story uh, of the the journey that we've just travelled. Well, thank you very much indeed for those answers. Thank you also for ve very good questions. If I could ask Peter Lederer, the chairman of IFF, to propose a word. Thanks, Peter. Uh, thank you very much, um, and I have my welcome from the IFF. But um, it, I've been privileged to work with uh, with John um, uh, through uh, some interesting times of our own as a chairman of a Quango uh, that had its own difficulties. Um, and I firsthand saw and experienced John's leadership, his management, and his diplomatic skills in a period of, as he said, of great change and huge sc and scrutiny, as we maybe never have known it before. Um, seeing Scotland afresh uh, has always been important to me. You know, I'm a kind of student of this because uh, I learned very early on. I've, I'm a, uh, born and raised in London. I've lived on three different continents. I carry a Canadian passport as well as a British one. And I came to Scotland. When I came to Glen Eagles in, at the end of 83, I thought I'd better join the local rotary and uh, kind of get engaged in the local community just because they were worried post uh, the um, uh, written, uh, uh, when we privatized Glen Eagles in 81 and all these questions about what we were going to do. So I joined, went to the local rotary and uh, they asked me to speak and I told them what my plans were and what my thoughts were coming back from Canada to Scotland. And uh, I sat down for the dinner afterwards and I asked, uh, you know, we were having a very good conversation after dinner, and I asked the president of the, uh, of the Rotary in Octorada, how long do I have to kind of be here to be accepted? <laughs> you know the same answer. He said, uh, <laughs> two generations should do it. <laughs> and so my grandchildren look forward to having some input into this conversation. But I have since then been a student. Uh, since then. And interestingly, I've spent the last 28 years selling Scotland um, with Michael Shea, interestingly enough, Michael and I spent many happy times uh, selling Scotland and having, having exactly this conversation about how do we sell Scotland. We go out into these markets and we're absolutely loved and people think this is great and then you come home and have a completely different conversation. Um, so John, that, that was terrific. I mean, I... Um, that perception of others, that list, the handling of constitutional change being seen positively, the aspiration, the ambition, the constitutional change without disruption, uh, easy birth, orderly infancy, minority government, the unusual rare success, and Scotland seen as a success. 59.67 and 14th, I think was the last time I saw those numbers was my best year at school. <laughs> um, so I knew that number... <laughs> That number had a particular impact on me, that, uh, if, if only if I was trying to get that good. Um, but what John, of course, didn't say in all of that was the role he played. In his usual modesty, much of that goes down to the leadership that John played in, in, within that whole that time. And I think there's, a, there's something about the disconnect that I talked about there, about how others see us and how... Scotland sees itself and how the conversation that goes on within Scotland versus the conversation that goes on out with Scotland. There's a role there for organisations like, I think, the Royal Society, certainly like uh, IFF, in trying to tease out and just change this conversation, change the, 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 the kind of words that are used and some of the, some of the thinking and start to so see some of the, uh, see how others see us in, in the same light. I think we, we need to do some work there. And I think your four propositions about understanding perceptions, increasing our interest in those uh, who show interest in us, absolutely. Uh, Scottish businesses, you're, you wouldn't uh, expect me to say any, agree, anything other than agree on that, capitalising on perceptions and the reputation of Scotland. Uh, and seeing the mutual advantage within the UK to maximise advantage. Um, we underestimate uh, the impact of the success of the past decade. And that, that's, I think, absolutely true. I think we must listen to... So to Sir John, we're fortunate to have him having led that process 
And I think we must use him now uh, for those insights, thoughts, and, a, and the call to action. So, John, on behalf of all of us, thank you very much indeed. And can I ask everybody to thank John in the usual way? John, thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you all very much indeed. There are drinks upstairs for those who can stay. Um, there will be an account of this evening on the websites, both of the Royal Society of Edinburgh and International Futures Forum, in about two weeks' time. And IFF has also had somebody doing a film right at the back, and I think that might appear on the website as well. Thank you all very much. Please go upstairs if you'd like to join us in a drink. <laughs>